Hey everybody, I'm Van Jones. I am Megan McCain. And we are so excited for you to watch this documentary, The Reunited States. This is such an important film for everyone to see, no matter which side of the aisle you're on. It is a powerful testimony to the fact that we can bridge these divisions. To have someone look at me as if we don't deserve to be respected, it does something to you. Every person can play a role in trying to pull this country back together. I wish there was something I could do to help her. Bring us back to a place that I think we all want to coexist and live in. If there has ever been a time for bridge building and for trust building, it is that time. I don't want other mothers to go through this. This is the moment that we decide to start healing instead of dividing. Watch this documentary. Be a part of this mission to move our country forward. You're listening to the Braver Angels podcast, a new way of talking politics. I'm your host, John Wood Jr. I'm joined today by my co-host, the illustrious Kieran Justice O'Connor. Kieran, how you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm thrilled to be here talking about this topic. Uh, absolutely. And on the topic of this topic, uh, we are joined by two illustrious guests, Miss, uh, Mrs. Aaron Leverton, who we are going to learn much more about in just a moment, and my old friend Ben Recky, director and mind behind the Reunited States documentary, which we are going to learn about the upcoming release of, but it's already making a powerful impact on the folks who have seen it all across America for the powerful and profound story it tells. Ben, Aaron, so great to have you both on the Brave Angels podcast. Thanks for having us, John and Kieran. You guys are doing fantastic work, so we're, we're excited to be here to, to dive into it. Mm. Yeah, excited to be here. Thank you guys for the work you're doing. Yeah. And happy birthday, Ben. Yes. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting. I didn't want to miss it. I would be here <laughs> any, any, any time. Oh man, well, I'm really, uh, really honored to know that you that uh, this is your birthday party right here. Uh, <laughs> January 28th is when we're recording this. So if anybody wants to know, uh, Ben is an Aquarius, I guess. Is that uh, is that right? Okay, that, that's right. And I hope, Kieran, that you brought the birthday cake. I don't see it anywhere, but we'll, uh... oh, that's that's for the uh, the after party. <laughs> I was, I was going to say we'll, we'll we'll email you a slice for sure. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, well, let's 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 jump right in. So the reunited states documentary that is highlighting what you might sort of term the, I mean, this word is already becoming a little bit, you know, kind of dicey because, you know, everything is politicized in America, but it's a, it's a documentary that I guess you could say sort of highlights the, the unity movement or the fact that there is a movement towards coming together in America that, you know, pre, that, that precedes the outcome of this, this most recent presidential election. Ben, what is the reunited States uh, documentary? Uh, why should folks care about the story it tells? Sure. Yeah. It's funny. You mentioned, you know, even these words are so politically charged now, um, mm -hmm. but you know, the bridge building movement, it's, it's been around for a long time, um, but more recently gained a lot of steam for, for everyday citizens realizing that, these level of divisions are, are taking a toll on us, on our lifestyle and, and on our uh, national security and, and, and our communities. And so um, the reunited States profiles four deeply personal stories of people on the journey to bridge our divides, whether they're political or racial or otherwise. Um, and the idea really was, you know, how do we frame this, that it's a citizens movement? You know, it's not something that uh, our elected officials alone can figure out there's 33 or there's 330 million of us and we all have a role to play in this every day we're either dividing or uniting based on our thoughts words and actions and so the four stories that are highlighted in the film you know Erin Leverton and, and her husband David who traveled across the country to find out what's dividing us Susan Bro who um, you know lost her daughter Heather Heyer in Charlottesville mm -hmm. when the car drove through the crowd she's been on a journey um, of, of reaching across the aisle and trying to avoid further violence by working through our differences Greg Orman, the independent uh, who's trying to break the three party system, ran for Senate in 2014 and for governor of Kansas, um, you know, to try and uh, bring a third force to our politics. And then Stephen Olacara, a good old friend of you guys as well, who started the Millennial Action Project to build a coalition of bipartisan young lawmakers who 
are committed to bridge building at, in government. And so it's really an honor to, to be bringing this out into the world at just the moment when it seems like people are ready to have this conversation. Not everyone is, and that's okay too. Um, but it seems like for all the times that it, we had hoped that it had come out earlier, that this is the moment that it's actually most receptive for this, for this message. Mm, absolutely. And so the documentary tracks, as you said, it tracks the stories of several incredible individuals. Um, Heather Heyer, by the way, is a former uh, guest of, uh, I'm sorry, S Susan Bro, mother of Heather Heyer, mm. um, was a former guest of this podcast uh, for folks who are interested in checking out that episode. She's an amazing person and her presence in the documentary, of course, is, is poignant. And of course, we're most of us will be well familiar with the uh, with the story of her of her daughter and her tragic loss in in Charlottesville. Um, but we are uh, blessed with uh, having uh, Aaron on the show with us uh, today. And uh, Aaron, can you take us through you and David's um, sort of backstory and what the documentary um, highlights in following the two of you on what was really an incredible journey? through America, and I guess a journey sort of through your own kind of view, view of the world and experiencing that changing perhaps in some ways over the course of that, over the course of that journey. Can you tell us about that? Sure, John. Um, so, you know, my husband's background is in politics. He worked um, sort of as a political operative for a little over a decade, and we met in Washington, D.C., a million years ago, and mm -hmm. we were both um, working on uh, the right side of things, meaning not the correct side, but the Republican side, um, and, you know, grew up in that world. It was very sort of in that bubble, in that mindset um, all through our lives, and Dave was very committed to the Republican Party, and then he left that world sort of dis disenchanted with the whole thing and then 2016 hit and that was sort of a wake-up call when I think one night he and I over dinner you know sort of realized he said I, I have helped create this monster um, that was when we started seeing a lot of violence you know in that 2016 presidential election and it that was when you know we thought it was bad and now you know four years later we're seeing things intensify even more and so one night over dinner, I just said, hey, if we didn't have kids or a mortgage, what would you want to go do with your life? And he said, I would want to do something to help bring unity and be a solution as opposed to a problem. Um, and that was when we began uh, our work with um, our nonprofit, Undivided Nation. And the first real goal was to understand division. And we realized we didn't. Mm -hmm. And there, we had in a million blind spots and nothing was really making sense. And so we decided to sell our home in Dallas and quit our jobs and buy an RV and go listen to people, listen to sto their stories and begin to sit basically at the feet of Americans and hear what they think is causing division. And what we learned trans completely transformed our lives um, and transformed our understanding, not only of America, but of ourselves. Now, were there a couple of particular um, moments or, or highlights that come to mind um, that were impactful on, on you and David in the course of that, um, to give folks a little bit of a taste of, sure. of what they'll observe when they, when they see the documentary? Well, the funny thing is, when we started the trip, we really believed that all of our division was sort of rooted in our political divide. And basically on day one, that theory got completely debunked. Um, but you know, you have to start somewhere, right? You know what you know, and you don't know what you don't know. Right, and we right. didn't know a whole lot. And so the most poignant moment of the whole trip was actually captured on film. And for me, um, Dave, Dave and I have different sort of watershed moments. Mine was the one that you see in the film, um, an exchange between myself and a woman named Michelle who lost her baby in the delivery room um, due to lack of care. And she's an African-American woman who has become one of my heroes. And she gave me, she gave me the greatest gift anyone can give, which is your story, like the depths of what has shaped you. And that sent me on a journey to all 50 states to ask 
why did this happen to my friend and how did it get this way? Generally speaking, um, I'd have to honestly say that I don't have a really great feeling towards white people. Um, a lot of it is because of some of my experiences and some of what I've seen my parents experience. Mm -hmm. I went into labor with my first child when I was seven months along. And my water broke while I was walking around the mall with my dad. He was buying baby clothes. Mm -hmm. And I went to the hospital. The nurse came in and I said, I think I'm having contractions. And she examined me very quickly and she said, oh, you're not ready to have this baby yet. You call me back in here when you're ready to have this baby. And they let me lay there for hours. By the time the doctor came, I was crowning. And my first baby died. And I know that they did not give me the care and the attention that I deserved. I lost my baby because they did not provide proper care for me. I'm so sorry. And it's so hard to know that I'm a good person, I'm a good mother, and to have someone look at me or to look at my children as if they're criminals, as if we don't deserve to be respected, we don't deserve to be treated fairly. It does something to you mentally and spiritually and emotionally. I've never forgotten losing my first child because I was a black, unwed mother. And they didn't think that my child's life was as important as the child be delivered in the room next to me. Ben, why was David and Aaron's story story important in the context of the documentary? What made you interested in in their role? Sure, I um, well, I guess to even get to their story, the the original sort of inspiration for the film um, came, you know, in first seeing Susan Bro speak and and you know on at a live event, and was just really moved by the fact that she had lost her daughter, but was able to talk about the need to work through our differences to avoid further violence. And it just hit me like a ton of bricks that here I was being very emotional about politics and it felt so petty when someone on the front lines of division who suffered this immense tragedy was able to come out as a voice of reason. So I went up to her and I said, I, I, I don't know how or why, but I really want to be a part of telling your story because I think it can help other people that are struggling with these emotions right now too. And she was gracious enough to agree and let us follow her and that, you know, uh, led me to Mark Gerzon eventually, um, who had written a book that this is based on, and uh, the reunited States of America, how to bridge the partisan divide. And he'd been doing this work for three decades. Mm -hmm. And so in talking to him, he sort of introduced me to the three other sets of stories. Um, and it was, you know, for when I said, I want to follow someone on the election night to show how to break this, this gridlock, he said, you should talk to Greg Orman. Uh, when I said, how did the youth get involved and do something? He said, talk to Stephen Olakara. And then he called me one day and was like, you know, there's this extraordinary story of this couple uh, with their kids that are driving across the country right now. I think you should talk to them and just listen to where they're, where they're coming from, what they're doing, because in my 30 years of doing this work, I've never come across something so extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I, I started talking to David and Aaron and was immediately floored at just that they had uprooted their lives and sold their house and really carved out a year to dedicate to understanding and listening and finding out where these divisions come from. And just in the first few minutes, I, I was hooked and I said, this is, this is the type of story that will uh, bring to life these ideas in a very visceral way and personal way for, for people. And so I, we spoke and I ended up meeting them on several points on the journey. Um, they had already started shooting some stuff just you know, to capture it, to make sure that they had it. And so we were able to incorporate and continue the journey and the story from there. And 
and our hope is that this really, you know, these ideas about bridge building are sometimes academic. They're sometimes hard to frame and, and embody. And story has a really important role in that in how we humanize these issues and, and, and go through the heart instead of through the head. Right. And their journey definitely did that. It was a heart journey. Aaron, I Aaron what was it? David, um, I, uh, just very quick, I got to hear David originally at the uh, Weave the Social Fabric uh, conference in D.C. and had a yeah, preview. You guys were like high five and everything. Because <laughs> his <laughs> earnestness was was uh, incredible back then. So it was mm -hmm. exciting to see you um, in this documentary. Karen, go ahead and jump in. Yeah, Aaron, I have a question. What was it like having the kids along? Because when I think about the problem of political polarization, it's really a generational challenge. And ultimately, it's going to be young people and future generations that inherit the consequences of the choices we make. So I just wonder, I mean, it's such an amazing story to take a road trip with your family, having your kids along and sort of seeing how they are experiencing these stories um, through, you know, a child's eyes. Yeah, it was you know, I think it intensified what we learned to have them with us in a lot of ways, because I'm going to, I'm going to say it this way, or I'll just tell a story and then I'll sort of explain why. So we were in Little Rock, Arkansas. It was our second stop on our journey. And we were at Central High School to tour the high school, which is also like a national historical site. It's a functioning high school. And so we, um, this is the site uh, where the Little Rock Nine, you know, historically in 19, I think 54, were sort of kept from going to school, if you recall. And it was international news and um, sort of a huge moment in American history. And we're standing there with our three kids who were at the time five, uh, two, five, and six. And, um, our middle daughter was pulling on my coat, trying to get my attention while this tour guide was talking us through what these nine kids went through. And um, I finally leaned down to see what she needed. And she said, mommy, what is a lynch? And it struck me that I was gonna have to explain what lynching is to my five-year-old and that there were children, not much older than her in that very place who were being threatened by adults with lynching <laughs> and um, it was it, having her ask me with her little voice made it so much more poignant for me because it could have been, you know, it, in, a, in a different universe that could have been her in a couple of years. Do you know what I mean? Um, it just brought, it, it really brought the whole thing home and put it in perspective for me. These things are recent and they're things that, um, that we need to not just know about, but really ponder deeply in our hearts that this is part of our story as a country. And, um, and you cannot wash over these things. So to answer your question, I, I would say everything that we learned was intensified because we were learning it with our kids. Hmm. Yeah, I think that so much of the a discovery and broadening process that you go through when you talk to people of different backgrounds is so much more impactful than the intellectual process of just reading or trying to engage with different narratives or rationalizations on paper. And I think that's something we try to do at Braver Angels is facilitate experiences where people actually get to hear those stories and those tales first up. And it seems like that's sort of similar to, to what you did in the film. And so I think, I know our members are thrilled about the film and I think, you know, millions of people will be. I know Ben, you mentioned at the beginning that, you know, some people are not ready to have this conversation. And so I wanted to ask a little bit about you know, some of the pushback you might get and, and how you respond to it. I think there are, you know, folks on the right in particular who sometimes see these kind of bridge building or unity movements as kind of a front uh, to enlighten them 
to all become liberal and they're sort of suspicious. And you're already hearing that pushback from conservatives to Biden's message of unity. When they hear Biden say unity, a lot of them think, well, it's unity on Biden's terms. If we're gonna build a house united, it's you have to come into our house and, and then you'll be unified. And then meanwhile, on the left, um, and I see this you know, among some of my own friends and network, there's uh, a sense that e even having these conversations is detrimental be be because by doing it, you're you know, quote unquote, normalizing views that are harmful or bigoted and that by giving them a platform, you're uh, legitimizing it just as you know, by Donald Trump having a Twitter account, he was able to um, put his rhetoric uh, so much wider, regardless of what you, uh, you know, think of his messages. So I wonder, Ben, how do you think about the, those two criticisms um, from both the left and the right that I imagine uh, you've gotten and, and you're going to get when the film comes out? Sure, and, and and I'm sure you know. Given the work that you guys do, you're you're no stranger to this controversy that comes. And I just want to acknowledge how important what you guys are doing as an organization, and to all your members that are listening, the fact that you're leaning into this this cause, no matter how difficult it seems, and going going through that journey of self discovery is it's one of the most inspiring things about making this film, and 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 Brave Rangers specifically has proved to me to be one of the most uh, powerful and scalable and uh, hands-on solutions to this kind of problem. So thank you for that. Um, we're getting a lot of pushback already. I mean, just by, you know, we're, we're very thrilled to have Van Jones and Megan McCain come on board as executive producers. That's also a, a lightning rod for a lot of people. And, you know, people are saying about both of them, like, are you kidding me, bridge builders? Like they're very controversial. People don't like that that Van worked with the Trump administration on criminal justice reform and that sometimes praises Trump for some of the things he did. And they call him, you know, everything from a race traitor to, you know, other other harmful words. And same with Megan, who, you know, has very strong opinions and airs them out on The View and other places. But, you know, it's part of the discussion. And she's on a show where three of her co-hosts are very left leaning. And so it's very, you know, she's the minority in that conversation. So I, I we're we're really uh, blessed that they were brave enough to get behind this film and, you know, reach across the aisle and say, if we can do it, th there's, there's hope, there's more people can do it. Um, but absolutely, I mean, you know, there's an article that ran today that, that says, you know, we're naive for putting out this film and this message in this time and that unless one party capitulates and, you know, acknowledges the facts and is not held accountable, like there's no way we can even talk. And, and so I think that like the unfortunate reality is that we are in a transformation as a country and we can either point our fingers and dig in our heels and say they're the enemy and we'll continue to go down this path that doesn't look like it you know has good outcomes or we can take ownership over what we have control over which is our own thoughts and beliefs of, towards the other side and our own sort of side and you know one of the <laughs> we got a tweet the other day that said defund the united states documentary you know, you, you centrists need to stay in 2020. And so we, we kind of knew that was coming. You know, the both sort of sides are uh, on the further fringes, like not willing to talk to one another. And that's okay. Like, I, like, I really do think that, you know, patience uh, about where people are on their own journey is uh, important because I used to say and do things that I'm ashamed of now about like things I didn't understand about race when I was younger. And so it's un unfair for me to kind of judge anyone else and say, you know, you're a racist or, you know, to use shaming or cancel culture to try and get someone to bend the knee. And so I, I guess, and the other misconception that I'll just try and clear up because it was helpful for me is that being a bridge builder does not mean becoming moderate. It doesn't mean letting go of your beliefs and trying to compromise, you know, what you, what you value. You can still hold deeply like, you know, con strong convictions about, about policy and about what you believe, it just means we're providing a better framework in which to discuss those where we're not demonizing and, and attacking each other. And again, preaching to the choir with, with the Braver Angels because a lot of this language came from my talks with John and from Bill and yourself over the past several years. So I really feel like you guys have been part of this journey with us. Mm. Aaron, I would be uh, thankful, well, Ben, first of all, thank you for that. And obviously, we can, we certainly can relate to uh, you know some of 
some of what you're likely to be experiencing in terms of, you know, blowback and criticism. And really that's just proof, I think, that you're making an impact. And so, you know, you, you've got you to roll with the punches, so to speak. Uh, Aaron, I would be curious to know if there have been reactions uh, within you and David's own personal lives with, you know, friends or possibly, you know, uh, former colleagues or associates in response to the, you know, to the stand that you guys are, are, are taking in this documentary and in your, in your bridge building work. Generally speaking, um, is there anything to, to report on that front? I mean, John, we've had so many people say, so are you guys Democrats now? <laughs> are you Democrats? And it's, right. it's funny because, you know, like Ben said, and like you just alluded to, like when you're making both sides angry, you're on the right track. I think, I think not to say like we're out to make everybody mad, but if this isn't about picking sides, you know, it's not about feeding this rhetoric. And um, so, yeah, I mean, we have had some, some pushback a little bit of people saying that we, we sold out on, um, you know, the truth or, or whatever. But I think that Mark Gerzon, you know, who wrote the book through United States, has so much wisdom on this. And I, I don't think this really boils down anymore to whether you lean right or left. I think this boils down to whether or not you are functioning as an open-hearted or a close-hearted person. Mm -hmm. And that is really, I think, what it boils down to. Um, our differences, like Ben said, are part of what make us spectacular and, and unique and beautiful. I mean, my daughter, um, Grace has down syndrome. She has an extra chromosome. We've been talking about the beauty of difference. And when we're afraid of difference, it hinders our ability to, um, to function as a society because we're, we're lost in this fear and this dehumanization of one another. And so, you know, I think when people, when people respond to our journey by saying, have you become a Democrat? I think that is a very fear-based question. Mm. I think um, when, we, when we can come into a conversation and say, what did you learn and how has it transformed you? I think what it has done is taken me, not from a Republican to a Democrat, but it has taken me from a closed-hearted person to an open-hearted person. Mm. Right. And it sounds like you're not slowing down any, so... That's certainly. <laughs> that certainly <laughs> no, I want I want everybody to drink the open heart Kool Aid because it's go. <laughs> it's good. Life is good when you're not afraid of your other. Mm. Life is good. Mm. And one of the things we talk about here at Braver Angels and uh, our colleague April Lawson has a has a piece out on this uh, subject uh, in in Common Magazine, which is worth uh, well worth reading, uh, is the fact that you can bridge. There, there's sort of a pre-existing orthodoxy in some bridging spaces that focuses just on us creating connections through the things that we have in common. And obviously, you know, that's an important thing, our shared humanity. But there's also deep connections to be found, not moving around our differences, but actually through our differences, that through our differences, we can actually discover valuable things in each other and connect on the basis of that, right? And I, and I think that your story, Aaron, you and David, is a powerful testimony to precisely what you're saying here to precisely that fact yeah mm, indeed okay I, yeah ben go ahead i had something i that came up while aaron was talking and you know it, it touches on kieran what you were saying before about you know um the controversy of trying to do this work i i think that um what's happened over the past few weeks and months you know is is pretty seismic and you know, we went through a very intense election that people still disagree on. And you know, I was at uh, a, a talk recently where you know someone messaged me and and said, you know, you're assuming um, what you're you're talking as if it's a fact that Biden won. And there's a lot of people that don't agree with that. And it really struck me that like the anger that people feel about you know, well, it's a fact. You know, count the numbers. This, the, the difficult truth is that, you know, there's different views about that. And, and whether I disagree with them strongly or not, or the data, I feel the data supports what I'm saying or not. The reality is tens of millions of people 
you know, still like question it. And so for me, I actually got on the phone and had a conversation with this person and I was just to understand and just to, just to say like, I didn't mean to offend anyone. I was, you know, like saying what I thought was, you know, the state of affairs, but tell me what, what you see and what you're hearing. And it was so enlightening for like an hour. And so I think like, and again, this, you know, you talk about risking normalizing, you know, some of this stuff, but to me, like, I'm thinking of this long term, like if we have 30, 40, 50 million people that don't necessarily think this is a legitimate presidency, that's not a small movement. And so, you know, the, the scale and scope of these shifts that we're undergoing are hard to comprehend in this moment. I think we'll look back on history books. And so I guess the big thing that has dawned on me recently is that it took us 10, 20, 30 years to get into this mess. It might take us as long to get out of it. And that's not a bad thing. That's something that we just maybe look at it as like, this is our generation's cold war. Like when, you know, Mark Gerzon was the first to say the cold war, when it ended, that's when we turned our enemies inside our country. We lost this external, you know, superpower that united us. And mm -hmm. once we lost that, we turned on each other. So maybe we're in our own cold war right now. And maybe this will pan out for a little while. And, and so for me, it's like, how do we, how do we really address the problems? How did we get here? How did we get to a place where people don't feel like they have a future in this country or that there's an opportunity for them? And, and there's a lot of communities that have never felt that this country had opportunity for them. And then there's more ones that are more recent over the past 30 or 40 years that are, that are like rising up and saying, you know, we don't feel represented. We don't feel hopeful. And so how do we get to that? How do we re-enfranchise people? And to me, that's the more in conjunction with the crisis management of not attacking each other and not living in this anxiety. What are the long-term things that we're looking at? And we need to do them side by side. Mm. Mm. And I think so much of this comes down to trust because we're hearing more and more people who come to us and say, you know, I love the goal. I want to have conversations, but how do I do it when we're not even subscribing to a shared reality and we're just living in, in two completely different worlds and we have our own different set of facts and we have a lot of liberals coming us to, to us particularly and saying, well, you know, how am I supposed to have a conversation with somebody whose worldview is so informed by conspiracy theories? Um, you know, how can I, how can I show them the light? Um, and ultimately I think, where we come down is that it's a question of trust more than, uh, you know, facts, because people, uh, very smart people end up believing in conspiracy theories. It's not because they're dumb. It's because there's a widespread breakdown in trust in institutions and sources of media in particular. And so people get siloed. And if, if every day you're being fed a certain narrative, um, it's, it's easy to believe that. And so, John, I wonder how you are thinking about this sort of, you know, epistemological crisis I, I get where people are just not even on the same playing field. So it's sort of hard to illuminate commonalities and you sort of have to step back um, and just sort of start with more basic understanding of people's experiences um, versus kind of getting lost in the weeds on uh, divisive topics. Yeah. And of course, I'd, I'd like to hear how Ben and Aaron um, wrestle with this. I think that you've, you've partially answered the question. My, my way of engaging this question is to say that we can't really dedicate ourselves effectively to the project of recreating a shared relationship uh, to facts and data, a shared epistemology, if you will, if we don't first revive uh, trust and really a culture of goodwill uh, between us uh, as, as Americans, I think that it, it, is, it is possible even when you have the same fact on the table, even when people agree on a fact, given the fact that we are so distrustful of each other and that we have such different instincts, we can interpret the same thing in a bunch of different directions. So it's not even just the fact that we have different facts, right? I mean, that's part of it. But just a quick example, um, when we had the uh, controversy over uh, then President Donald Trump's call uh, with the uh, president of Ukraine, the one where, you know, people were accusing the president of leaning on uh, Ukraine to go after the Bidens and folks uh, 
folks on you know folks on the left said he did that folks on the right said no this was a perfectly innocent call trump said it was a perfect phone call well we all know what uh was said in that conversation it was actually written out <laughs> there was a transcript line by line by line right but we interpreted that event differently uh trump made a you know a statement about how there were things going on in Ukraine related to the Bidens that should be looked into. And then not too long later, he made mention of funding for, for the uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian government. Um, for folks who already believe that you couldn't trust Donald Trump, that he was corrupt and cynical and so on and so forth, that was a damning juxtaposition. For folks who believe that Trump was there to clean out the swamp, all this is evidence of is the fact that Trump is cleaning out the swamp not just in D.C. here, but that he's trying to hold folks internationally to account and the Bidens are swamp creatures and therefore why wouldn't he, you know, put a, put a discerning eye on what they're doing. And so, but taking Trump out of it and taking Biden out of it, we have a similar level of distrust for each other in American life. And so the power of the documentary, in my view, is in the extraordinary sort of, you know, uh, uh, ability to show these deeply human stories of growth and transformation across a, a wide spectrum of, of, American, of American life. I mean, you know, you've got the main storylines that the documentary follows, but Aaron, uh, the, you know, all the people that you and David meet along the way, you know, contribute to this. And I think that as we come back to the point of really being able to humanize each other in those personal terms, where that trust is rebuilt, then we can have more meaningful conversations over what the shape of our political reality actually is. So that, that's kind of how I deal with it. Do you guys get that, um, that same sort of question thrown at you, Aaron or Ben, and, and how do you respond to it? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in right there. Um, you know, we're so, we're, we're so hung up on agreement. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the big ahas for me on our trip was realizing that agreement has nothing to do with unity, mm. nothing. Yeah. Um, in fact, I would say agreement weakens unity because, and here's why, because, you know, I, it was Dr. King who was actually quoting someone else and I'm not sure who, but he said, um, famously that love is the most endurable, uh, durable power in the world. Love is the most durable power in the world. And I think the reason he said that, and the reason it's important to understand is because agreement is cheap. It's like a plastic toy you get in your happy meal, you know, and um, love on the other hand is durable and it can hold the weight of disagreement. And so what you're talking about with trust, John, okay. it's really important because without trust, without love, dis disagreements will tear us apart. But if we have honor for one another, like let's, let's say you and I are talking about any topic, any policy any issue let's make it abortion like if we're talking about abortion and you're and you are very pro-choice and i'm very pro-life and you know we we get to the point where we are at an impasse what holds our relationship in place at that impasse is not going to be agreement it's going to be love and honor for one another and the way that i will love and honor you is if i know your story and carry you in my heart as as a fellow human being as my brother you see what I'm saying? Um, and this, this is operating at a much higher level, at a much higher frequency than we are currently as human beings. But we were made for connection. We were made to love each other in this way. And um, because all of those, because of all, because all of those possible connections, like I call them love connections, are broken right now, there's nothing to hold the tension, you know, that positive tension that Dr. King talked about. There's nothing durable right now to hold that tension in place, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that tension for, for like a positive peace as opposed to the absence of tension. That's mm -hmm. not real relationship. Anyone who's married or has a friend can tell you if you don't ever have tension in the relationship, then there is no relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I really firmly believe that what we need to do is hear each other's stories. Mm. Uh, you, yeah. couldn't have, you couldn't have said that better, Aaron. That was very powerful. Um, and yeah, it gets to the piece that we're missing. Uh, ben, is that a question that you wrestle with this fact 
this this question over facts, shared reality, and yes, so forth. very much so, very yeah. much so, and I think a lot of us do. Um, you know the how to put this the we we do live in two different realities now, right? Like, there's not any question of that, and I think that you know, of course, it would be ideal that we all shared the same set of facts and that we could all agree on the reality that we live in. And that's much more a thriving democracy could function from that. And the, re the re unfortunate reality is that we don't, we're in two very different worlds. And so I think we can you know, either stick in our heels and say, unless you play by my rules, we can't even play. Or we can say, okay, let's put that aside because that's a, something we're gonna have to deal with and we're dealing with it. But let's get, let, can we talk for a second about how you came to this view and where, you know, what, what you're feeling, where your pain is, because that's where we have common ground is common pain. And so I think, you know, when the left, when the right looks at the left and says this unity agenda is a way for us to, you know, to bend the knee or to take away our rights. If you, if you agree with us, then we can have unity. Um, that's the message that is being heard from some portions of the right. It's also based in a historical relationship where they felt, you know, looked down upon by the liberal elites. And mm -hmm. in some ways, we re the left reinforces that and says like, oh, you're, you know, you're de you need to be deprogrammed, you're not educated. And so like, of course, there's going to be like a, a lack of common trust because th those stereotypes have been reinforced, you know, by, by the um, different factions. And so I think for me, like when I hear some of the beliefs that sound maybe like people say conspiracy theories, I remember growing up, my friends on the left had those conspiracy theories. It was called the Illuminati. Now it's called QAnon. Mm -hmm. And so like, I don't think it's, you know, so far different that when one side or the other feels disenfranchised, there's an explanation that emerges for why that might be the case. And so I don't think it's fair to say you know, people living in a, 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 a illusion of a world. It's like, these are, these are the same ideas that have been passed back and forth to both sides. Mm. And so for me, I guess it's really, you know, I don't want to normalize and say facts don't matter because of course they do, but in this moment, that's not going to be the entry point for conversation. And if we're hung up on that, we're not even going to have the conversation. And so I think the heart movement that Aaron's talking about, that you're talking about is the one like, in that conversation I had with someone yesterday um, who was actually a progressive, very far left, and then over the past four years moved over to the right and now is like voted for Trump and is very, you know, um, like doesn't believe this election was legitimate. And I just listened and I just kept asking questions. And I told her at one point, I was like, I have no judgment here. I'm just very curious. And she's like, I can feel that from you. That's why I feel comfortable talking to you. And that's where trust happens. And if we can all do that, because I think when we say we need to agree on facts, it means like you need to agree with me or else you're wrong. And so how do we individually message that to people that we disagree with? We're not in this conversation to change your mind. We're here to understand where you're coming from. And that's a very different motive. I love the analogy with uh, the Illuminati because I feel like, you know, if you're on the left and you're hanging with your friends and one of them starts going off about the Illuminati, your reaction is like kind of like maybe you roll your eyes a little bit but you're like, oh, that's kind of funny. Like, you know, that's a little crazy, but it like also is a signifier that they're, you know, kind of down with the cause. Um, and I think if you're on the left and then you sort of take that view of QAnon, you can kind of see how a lot of the folks on the right, like they don't necessarily agree with QAnon, but they're sort of like, well, you know, it's kind of funny. And it's like, it's also a signifier that th that person is kind of down for the cause, particularly when you have, you know, leaders and, 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 and models who are sort of like introducing that into the mainstream. So I just thought that was interesting. So I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Kieran, uh, what are your highlights, man, from the, um, from the conversation we've, we've, we've had here? I mean, and, and before you answer that, let me just say, I do feel like this documentary represents kind of a bit of a seminal moment, you know, for this larger sort of bridge building movement and in in producing a piece that I think, you know, a wider body of the American people are going to be able to sort of, you know, sink their fingers into a little bit. 
and feel the fact that this cultural momentum is real and that it's not just a few, you know, naive idealists, but rather, you know, real waves um, of American society that are moving in this direction and trying to find each other in an open hearted sort of way, um, in the way Aaron said. And so, you know, I, I'm just, I'm struck by that. And Kieran, I'm, I'm wondering if you're, if you feel something similar. Yeah, it does feel like we're sort of at a, a inflection point or, or watershed where this stuff is becoming more mainstream. I mean, I know when we first started Brave Angels, it was sort of this kind of quixotic, um, you know, boys on the bus uh, <laughs> vibe. And uh, maybe that was similar when you guys were first uh, starting out. And I think the key to the film and also Brave Angels is that it's it's action oriented because, you know, obviously we don't have to convince people that this is a problem you know, polarization, people are unhappy, you know, it's affecting mental health, you're just sort of scrolling through, uh, confirming your biases, but also sort of consumed with this sense of helplessness. And so I think what Braver Angels and also the film shows people is that really, the the way out is through and to try to take action. And, um, you know, sort of lean into the discomfort. And that's what actually helps make progress. Um, and ironically, if your goal really is to be an activist and persuade people, it actually strengthens your ability to do that. If you know how to talk to people who disagree with you in their language and sort of open their heart. And because when you build the trust and relationship, that's when you can actually explore common ground in good faith and, and maybe actually then advance your arguments because people will be willing to listen. Uh, versus just completely staying within your own tribe where you're either not talking to others at all and just talking to your own side about how um, you know harmful they are, or if you are engaging with the other side, it's purely vitriolic. And so I think we're arriving at a point where people are um, understanding that it's counterproductive. And even if people think that like, you know, on the political level, if you're working in the White House or you're working on Mitch McConnell's staff, there's sort of a different calculus where like, you know, you have to do this to get that. I think on the more human level, especially when people come from politically divided families or communities or workplaces, they realize that our current approach is not working and, but they might not necessarily know uh, how to take that first step out there because they're sort of worried they're just going to get their, you know, arm chopped off. Um, but I think what the film and what Brave Angels um, does is it shows there actually is a movement of people working on this and there are opportunities to get involved. And I think that's another thing that's interesting, uh, Ben, is I think you're not thinking about the film just as sort of a passive product that people can sort of consume and maybe feel good that night and then move on with their lives. It's really sort of uh, an invitation and an entree into this larger movement where people can take action. So you, you watch the film and you're like, oh, yes, like this is what's needed. Um, then, you know, they can go to the website and they can actually sign up to get involved, whether that's, um, you know, taking a Braver Angels workshop or starting a conversation in their community. And so I think that's an innovative approach and it feels like there's a critical mass. There's, you know, celebrities like Van Jones and Megan McCain who believe in this. There are even politicians, um, you know, maybe they're not necessarily um, as influential as, as more divisive politicians, but I think on the left and the right there, there is a movement. And so obviously the headwinds are stiff and the forces that divide us are real and strong. And that's because the disagreements we have are real and we shouldn't try to paper them, them over because um, it has real consequences on people's lives. But there is this sort of deeper, um, more transcendent, more potentially transformative project. And I think the way that Aaron said it is sort of shifting the binary between uh, you know, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative to um, open hearted, close hearted is really interesting because that's sort of a universal uh, desire of people to be more open hearted. But there's also a fear uh, that if they do that, they're going to get cut off from their own team um, and their own friends who are going to say, you're a sellout, you're a traitor, you know, why are you fraternizing with the enemy? And so I think showing people that there is a movement 
makes it easier because then you're not alone um, and giving people opportunities to sort of take that first step because it really is a risk. You know, you really have to put yourself out there because you know you're going to get invective from people who disagree with you and judgment from people who do agree with you. And so you kind of need to have a bit of um, equipment and, and, you know, folks, folks on your team who can cover for you. Um, and then eventually, you know, our bandwagon will become so big that it's just the hottest thing to do in town <laughs> and, and people will jump aboard, hopefully. Yeah. Ben, what are you hoping people do as a result of, of watching this documentary? Yeah, I, well, I love, Kieran, you summed it up so beautifully. I think um, the first thing is, you know, a lot of us feel hopeless that there's no solution, there's no path forward. But what we really hope the film does is give people agency and say, there's things you can do right now where you are starting today. And one of those, you know, is, is to realize that, you know, power over every decision you make is either dividing or uniting us, what you post on social media, how you talk to your friends and family. Those are all micro decisions that weave our fabric together. The second thing that sort of, you know, comes off of that is, is the website that we've actually been working with you guys on, with Bill on, is to how do we get, make these ideas more tangible for people that they can just pick up and start like, you know, putting into their daily lives. And so if you go to reunitedstates.tv, it's not launching yet. It's going to launch on the release day of the film on, on, on uh, the 9th. Uh, you'll see like a sort of sequence of events that says, here's, you know, some ideas to talk to family, talk to friends. And so we really want that to be the next step. And then from there, like getting involved in organizations like you guys, I mean, your podcast, I listened to the first episode when I was started this research two and a half years ago. And I, I was like, thank goodness that there's people out there that are already on this wavelength and doing this. And so I really feel like I, you guys helped inspire this and you guys have been involved in the whole journey and guiding the process. The other action item, just to invite everyone who's listening to this, we're having a red and blue carpet premiere of the film that's happening on February 11th. Uh, Van Jones and Megan are the keynote speakers, and it's not. We're not going to show the film. We're gonna we're gonna take that 70 minutes to to talk about some of these ideas and spotlight some of the everyday heroes that are out there doing this work. And there's some really emotional encounters that we think might come out of it. A few Brave Angels members might even be there to tell their stories, uh, being at the Capitol and, and whatnot. And so I am really excited. If you anyone wants to come, reunitedstates.com slash premiere, um, sign up. We're, we're hoping to make a big uh, splash of that. And, you know, just continuing these stories. I think this is a journey that we're all on. And so hopefully this will go into other types of media. I mean, media has been used to divide us, but like you guys are doing with this podcast, what we're trying to do with this film, media can also be part of what brings us back together. Mm -hmm. And so story does have a role to play in it and we all do too. And, and yeah, so we're hoping that this is just the beginning of it. That's right. And we'll be sure to include the link uh, that you just mentioned um, in the description to this episode. And so, yeah, we want people to check that out uh, because it is powerful and it's incredible what you guys are doing. And Aaron, any next steps for you and David? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we really want to just be helpful to this growing, like, you know, like, like you guys have alluded to that this is this is a, um, a movement and I think it's going to grow as people become disillusioned with this sort of close hearted binary choice that's been handed to us. I think, um, you know, any way that we can serve in helping people along on the journey um, is, is what we want to do. So, you know, undividednation.us is our website and we're putting together some toolkits and offering ourselves in any way that we can be um, helpful to leaders, to individuals, um, organizations. I mean, it's, this, this is a seismic shift that we're looking at making um, in, and I think it really starts on the ground, like in house, in our homes, in our communities, in our businesses, um, to make this shift to open heartedness. And, you know, there are a lot of people who feel disenfranchised right now. And, um, the best thing we can do is look for the people around us who are hurting and listen to them and love them and meet them where they're at. Um, you know, my big takeaway from the film is that there is not a person out there who doesn't have something to teach you or me. Mm. And it could be a white supremacist walk marching through Charlottesville. 
um, to look at that person and believe that there's gold inside that person um, and that that person has something to teach you, I think is, is a skill set that we need to develop. Mm. Uh, or, you know, on the other side, you know, someone marching through the streets uh, with Antifa. I mean, we are missing one another. And until we can begin to see one another, I think we're going to be hopelessly lost as mm. well as our future. And so um, Dave and I, our, our heart and our desire is to serve as, as a catalyst and as a voice in any way that we can moving forward. Right. Yeah. These are hard things, you know, very, very it, hard. Very hard. Um, yeah. It, it takes some real sort of, sort of heartfelt courage, if you will, uh, to be able to sort of, you know, endure the discomfort that comes with going that far into reaching the humanity of folks who, you know, who, whose worldviews or perspectives may be very much at odds with what you believe, but also doing so because at the end of the day, you know, I mean, as, as Dr. King taught, we, we advocate for truth in a spirit of love so we can rebuild the community that we all share together, you know, this right. idea of the beloved community. And for those of us who believe in that, we can't afford to see anybody as outside of that, right? not without making the effort to to reach out to what's best in them so mm -hmm. thank both of you uh ben aaron so glad that you guys got to join us today i doubt that this is the last conversation we are going to have or that it'll be the last time that our uh, our members and our audience will hear from you both and so um thanks thank for you. having us yeah such a pleasure guys thank you next yeah. time they will join <laughs> yeah yeah tell them we've got to we've got to get them in for round two you, know, and you guys are real change agents in this space i like i i really mean it you know i've learned so much from from the whole team and ethos and out of many of the organizations i've found braver angels like i said to me has been personally one of the most helpful in my own journey so thank you guys yeah indeed well the feeling is mutual um, and for everybody listening, if you are not a member, if you want to get involved in the work that you hear being described today in this episode, uh, join us. You can visit us at braverangels.org. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe to this podcast. We're building a house united. Until next time.